You don't realize how reliant you are on certain things until you just don't have them anymore. Or maybe you go a week without them. You can just ask the kids in my youth group when I was a youth minister back in Fort Worth. Uh, we'd go to camp every single year. And every single year there was the most dreaded, most hated, most despised rule that we had and that was no cell phones in the cabins because we wanted the kids to disconnect for a week to focus on their spiritual lives, and also to protect them from losing something that was very valuable, especially while they were away from home. Now, oftentimes, we'd end up collecting phones all throughout the week. Over the course of the week, there were always a kid who thought they were sneaky, but we'd end up finding them. I remember catching one kid with their cell phone out, and I asked him, I was like, hey man, you know, let me hold on to that for you uh, until the end of the week. And so what I did was I, I told him I'd put a piece of masking tape on it, I'd write his name on it, put it in a bag, uh, put it in my bag, in my suitcase. And he was a bit annoyed with that, but he handed it over to me, and I put it in my suitcase. It wasn't less than three hours later, I came back into the cabin, and I saw my bag completely open. I saw all of my clothes out of the bag, everything, and I saw this kid sitting in his bunk texting on the phone that he gave to me, the phone that I took away. And he looked at me, he saw that he was caught, and he said, Man, uh, sorry, Paul. Uh, yeah, this is pretty awkward. I'm just a, uh, I'm just really bored, man, and I just want to text my girlfriend. <sighs> anyway, uh, we become so reliant on things that don't really matter and aren't really necessary. And the more and more we value those things, the more reliant we become on them. But if there is anything or anyone that is worthy of our absolute reliance, it's Jesus Christ. See, He's the life. He's the way, the truth, right? Uh, the bread, he's the resurrection. He's the shepherd, he's the door. He's everything that we need and we can't possibly live to our potential that God had desired and planned for us before we were even created if we aren't absolutely reliant upon him. You know, Jesus talks about this with his disciples in John chapter 15. I want to see if you have your Bibles to go ahead and turn over there to John 15. We're going to go ahead and read verse 1 through verse 8. John chapter 15, verse 1 through verse 8. And it reads, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. So branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Let's go ahead and stop there. Why would Jesus, why would he use this imagery of the vine? Like all of the I am figures he uses, uh, it came from ancient Jewish tradition and culture. Now, the vine and the vineyard, they were old and sacred images in Judaism. As a matter of fact, the coins of the, uh, the Maccabees had a vine on it. Uh, there was this great golden vine upon the front of the holy place in the temple itself. The vine represented the covenant people of God, Israel, planted and tended by him so that Israel would produce fruit. As a matter of fact, the prophet Hosea in Hosea 10 verse 1, he writes, Israel is a luxuriant fruit, or rather a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. Typically in the Old Testament, when Israel is depicted as a vine or a vineyard, though, the nation is being chastised for not bearing fruit as God expected. All throughout Jewish history and literature, the vineyard image uh, continued to be a part, a favorite part uh, of, of, of uh, imagery and was used a lot as a teaching device by rabbis. Jesus, aside from this occurrence that we're reading of in John chapter 15, he uses it several times in his ministry. You remember like the parable of the laborers in the vineyard there in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1 through 7 as well as the parable of the two sons uh, whose father had a vineyard in Matthew chapter 21. And then you also got the parable of the barren fig tree in Luke 13. But Jesus here, he points to himself and he says, 
I am the true vine. Now, the word true, authentic, genuine, it's significant. See, Israel, the nation, thought that they were the vine because they are referenced all throughout the Old Testament as a vine in a lot of scripture. And yet, oftentimes, in the Old Testament, the symbol of the vine in reference to Israel is used in context of their spiritual degeneration. As a matter of fact, the prophet uh, Jeremiah called the nation of Israel uh, that had gotten so wicked in his days, he called them a wild vine. What Jesus is saying here, he's saying, I'm the true vine. And he's saying, you think that because you're the nation of Israel, you think that that you're the true vine, but you're a degenerate vine. I am the true vine. I'm the real hope. It's not in your national identity. It's not in your culture. It's in me. Jesus isn't saying, or rather, he isn't just saying that the nationalism and patriotism can't bear hope. He's also saying that ethnic Israel really isn't the people of God if they don't abide in him. The true Israel is God's children, and they're not just made up of Jewish people, but Gentiles as well. In Romans chapter 9, Paul lays this out, even saying there in verse 9, that it is not the children of the flesh, as he says, who are the children of God. But the children of God, they're the children of praise as counted as Abraham's offspring, and that those of the faith are, as he describes in the book of Galatians, the sons of Abraham in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. See, the true spiritual Israel, the church, can only be found in Christ, who is the true vine. Next, he says his father is the vine dresser. And you see, the vine dresser is the person who they, their job was to prune, train, cultivate the vine. He's not just some hired hand. He's the owner of the vineyard whose personal interest in his vineyard, in that vine, is why he put so much effort and care into it. Uh, Now, the vine was grown all over Palestine. Uh, It's a plant which needs a lot of attention uh, if the best fruit is going to be harvested from it. Now, the vine itself, the vine can't produce the crop it was capable without a lot of pruning, without a lot of care, and Jesus knew that. See, what they do is they remove unfruitful branches, and he prunes the rest. That is the vine dresser. Now, Christ is the vine. The Father is the vine dresser. But now, uh, Jesus introduces us to another aspect of this particular relationship, the branches. Uh, Jesus says, the branches in him that do not bear fruit, the vine dresser, what does he do with them? He takes them away. See, since Jesus is the vine, The branches that are in him derive their life from him. He is the source in which they grow. He's their nourishment. The branches cannot survive apart from the vine, but there are some, there are some branches that don't produce fruit. See, they have the source of life. They have, they have what the other branches have to keep them strong, uh, but they, they just don't produce. Because of this, to protect the rest of the branches, Uh, The branches that aren't producing anything, they have to be cut off. See, they grew to be like a branch, like the way the other branches did, but their growth stunted. And they won't go beyond just being a branch. The wood from vine is useless. So without bearing fruit, what use is just being a branch? So who then are the branches? See, the fruit-producing branches are those who are bearing the fruit of the Lord. They're healthy. They're spiritually, uh, they're spiritually sound. They're allowing for the vine, Jesus, to nourish them and for the vine dresser, the Father, to nurture them with care and with patience. See, they're the children of God who grow and they grow and they thrive. Then there are the branches that don't bear fruit. Those who came into life just like the fruitful branches, but the difference is they don't progress. Rather, they digress and they die. They're added to the church just like everyone else and born new through Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul rebuking the Galatians, the unfruitful uh, branches there in Galatia, uh, he writes them uh, talking about this. He says, for in Christ, he says this, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were, and he uses the phrase, baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 through 27. But here's the difference with these particular branches. They lost their first love like Jesus rebuked the Ephesians in the book of Revelation. What happened, though? See, the word that Jesus frequently uses in John 15 is the word abide. 
The word abide, stay with me, attach yourselves to me, remain with me. See, the growing disciple in whom the Father and the Son live, according to what he said in John chapter 14, there in verse 20 through 23, through the Spirit, as he said in chapter 14 and in verse 16, that disciple is one whose life is absolutely dependent on Christ. Discipleship is not just a matter of acknowledging who Jesus is. It's having a strong spiritual connection to him and having him strongly connected to our inner lives. That's what abiding looks like. But you see, those branches, those Christians that don't grow and produce fruit, it's because they didn't abide in Christ, his word, his plan, his love. And what is the result of that? Remember what Jesus says in verse 6. He says that they are thrown away with the other branches that also don't produce, that don't grow. He says they're gathered and then thrown into the fire and burned. See, it's crystal clear in this passage. It's crystal clear that abiding equals growth, not abiding equals death. See, the church of Galatia, going back to that again, had seriously messed up priorities and values, which caused them to stop abiding in Jesus, and they weren't fruitful any longer. Paul told them in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 4, he says, you are severed from Christ you who would be justified by the law, he says, you have fallen from grace. You know, these branches were connected to the vine and they received life, but eventually they became unfruitful. They were cut from the vine and thus they were gathered up. They were cast into the fire. See, there are those who don't believe falling away from God is possible. Yet, there are well over 2,000 references to that in Scripture, and it's a reality. And Jesus here in the upper room is warning his disciples to not allow themselves to do the same. He says in verse 8 that God is glorified in bearing fruit. Why? See, see, God is not glorified by just saying praise and worship alone. But he's glorified by his disciples growing and bearing fruit. That's realistic. Anyone can sing a song. Or, or listen to a sermon, or, or put money in the collection plate. Those may be markers of spiritual maturity, but they're not always. Those whose lives are in harmony with Jesus, they find themselves growing and thriving, and they find themselves controlled by the word of God. They find themselves growing and thriving outside of the walls of the assembly. They don't just go about the motions. Yeah, as a matter of fact, Jesus wrote in Matthew chapter 15, he says that these people honor me with their lips. In other words, they just say it. They say, praise God, but their hearts are far from me. But those who are part of Jesus and choose to abide in him through everything life may throw their way, they produce plentiful fruit. Remember the psalmist, he, de he describes a person who abides with God in Psalm 1. And he says there, beginning in verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, or the scoffers, as the ESV puts it. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf, it doesn't wither. In all that he does, he prospers. But then the psalmist says, the wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Let's be realistic. We can do nothing without Christ. Paul would say in Philippians chapter 4, and verse 13, a verse that most of us probably know, I can do all things through him, through Christ, right, who strengthens me. Later on in verse 19, in that same chapter, he says, and my God shall supply all, not some, not portion, but all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Christ is the very source of our life. He's the very reason why we can press on. And as we depend on him more and more and seek to follow him more and more all because of his great love for us and our great love for him we bear fruit but what does that look like what does it look like to bear fruit that brings glory to God Paul describes what this looks like in uh, Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 16 through verse 26 this is what Paul says he says but I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit he says, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. He lists, he gives a list. He says sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Paul tells the Galatians, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then here's the, contra here's the contrasting point. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. You see... That's what producing good fruit looks like. That's what it means to bear fruit. It means to emulate uh, the life in which the spirit uh, that we see in the word of God, emulate that life in which Jesus Christ had lived himself. Every single one of those fruit of the spirit, Jesus lived. Love, joy, peace, all of it. Jesus lived himself. And that's the reason why we're able to do it because he is the very source, but apart from him, we can't truly live that way. And that's the key that he wanted his disciples to understand. He was going to be leaving them. Remember, he's reminding them, leaving them at least in the flesh. He's going to be going home to his father, like the way we talked about last week. He's going to, he's going to rise. He's going to rise from the dead. He's going, to, he's going to be with them a couple days, but then he's returning home. And then someday he will return to bring his children home to that home that he's prepared for them. But the thing that he wanted them to understand, there are many things in which he taught in the upper room, but this particular aspect, he wanted them to have their minds wrapped around that apart from me, you can't do anything. Do not rely in just being a Jew. Do not rely in just being somebody who has read the Bible their whole life. Do not rely on your national heritage. Do not rely on what your family has believed. Rely on me and me alone. Put your absolute dependency on me. Because let's be realistic. A lot of times we put our dependency on things that eventually do fail us. But he's saying, I am the vine. I'm the source. Because a lot of these I am's deal with him saying, I nourish. I'm life. I'm everything you need. Like bread. Like, like, uh, like life. Like uh, well, you know all the things that he talks about, right? Like the shepherd. You need me to survive. And he's saying, look, if you're a branch, if you're in me, you're my branch. And apart from me, you can't live. You wither away, you die. If you don't produce anything, there's no life in you. But if you're a part of me, then show you're a part of me by bearing fruit. Don't just worship me in words. Don't just worship me in song. Don't just worship me in truth. Worship me in spirit. And demonstrate that. Don't just read your Bible, but seek to apply it in your everyday life. Don't just talk about service. Do service. Don't just give but even in the book of 2 Corinthians, we're taught how to give, right? I mean, because all of these things have to balance down to the fact that we're absolutely reliant on Jesus Christ and we are wanting and we desire to show that we are a part of his family. Later on in this chapter, Jesus is going to say, you want me to show you how you bear fruit? You love one another, just as I have loved you. You know, it's a, a big way of showing that you are truly a part of my family, you're truly a part of the vine, a way that you truly show that you're my friend indeed, if you keep my commandments. You go forth, and not just say, but do, and live. Because you have everything that you need to do that. Jesus being the vine is everything that we need to be able to truly bear good fruit. If you have gone through this life outside of Jesus Christ, just as we talked about last week when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life there in John chapter 14 and verse 6, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no salvation outside of Christ. There's no alternative plan. There's no, there's no, well, you know, here is plan B. In case that didn't work out for you, here's plan B. Hopefully that'll get you there. There's nothing apart from Jesus Christ. And when you are a part of Christ, there is no, there's no ability to grow without Jesus. That's the thing that we have to remind ourselves that, you know, there are people who become Christians and then they try to do Christianity the way they think it should be done. 
They try to do Christianity the way they maybe, maybe incorrectly have been taught. They try to do Christianity on their own terms and not realizing that it's all laid out in this book for us. It's all laid out there so that we can grow and help others do the same. But we've got to be the disciples that Jesus asked us to be, desires for us to be, died for us to be, and loved us to be. And disciples bear fruit. Are you bearing fruit? Are you a fruitful branch? Are you a branch that's withered and dying? Here's the thing. Again, just like all throughout the New Testament, there's so many passages that talk about, about falling away, about, about you, know, you know, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Uh, Therefore, if anyone thinks he stands, take heed, lest he do what? Lest he fall. Paul writing there is not writing to people who are outside of Christ. Paul's writing to people who are in Christ. Even that passage that I referenced earlier in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, when Paul says, you've fallen from grace, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to people that at one point were attached to the vine, but they were dying. And he tells him, you're going to be severed. There were two individuals that Paul told Timothy that they're like gangrene. Their message is gangrene and it needs to be cut off. And the reason why that vine dresser, God, the reason why he does that is to protect the rest of the body. But he doesn't want that to be your fate. He wants you to produce good fruit. And he's given you everything possible through his son to be able to do that. Let me tell you, if you produce good fruit, you're going to hear someday, well done, good and faithful servant. And and producing good fruit is not some shallow, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this. No, it's manifested by the love that you have in Jesus Christ. And that's what pours forth. That's the reason why the first fruit of the Spirit is love, because that's the foundation of it. I can't do all those other things if 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 I don't have love. Love Christ because he loves you. Follow him, seek him. If there's anything that we can be doing for you today, if there's anything that we can be mindful of, let us know. We love you a lot. I love you. Uh, God bless you. I pray that you guys have an awesome rest of the week. Thank you guys for watching these videos. Thank you for supporting uh, the congregation during this time to be able to do this work as we are in the middle of, of a world, of a world situation that beyond our control, but absolutely in God's control. I want to thank you guys again. Love you. God bless.